place I could plug in my laptop? Yeah. It's not running out, but I just better safe than sorry, right? <laughs> sure, sure. Better safe than sorry. No technical difficulties. Perfect. This is, I just got this lap Mac and I was so happy they gave me the old one. I was like, thank you so much. No one ever wishes for old technology, except in this case. How does that look? Cool. There we go. Does that look better? Yes, it is. So everyone can watch me do my... Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So today, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, awesome. So actually, I just recently got a promotion. I'm now a developer advocate, not a technical evangelist. So last week was a good day. All right. So what are we going to be actually talking about today? So we're going to be talking about what is the problem that we're actually trying to solve? We're going to do a quick lightning speed, everyone, because I got 35 minutes and we have lunch. So we're going to do the world's fastest introduction to Apache Cassandra. What it, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> what it is, why do I need it? Introduction to Apache Spark, also the world record quickest introduction to Apache Spark that's ever been done. What is it, why do I need it? Then, what is sentiment analysis? And how does DataSax Enterprise Analytics, how does that help us? And then we're going to do an overview of the demo, and then we're going to do a live demo. Because why not, right? OK, so a little bit about me. So I'm actually a Southern California native. I was born in Redlands. And so I'm really excited to be here in the new Silicon Beach, um, because I think there's a lot of talent. And I'm one of those people that came out of this area um, here in Southern California. So it's really exciting to be here at Big Data Day LA. Um, but um, I'm actually based in Silicon Valley now. Um, I graduated with my MS in Computer Science and Engineering from Santa Clara in 2012. So the last six years, I've been working in industry. I've worked at a very various different types of companies, Lockheed Martin, HP, Teradata. I worked at a startup called Estgen, and now I'm at DataStax. So I'm also an Apache committer and a PMC member. I did all the initial um, contribution of all the install work and deployment on um, an Apache project, top-level project, called Trophodian. So just some fun about me, my keywords, my favorite things are Disney, the cloud, dogs, Linux, databases, big data, analytics, testing. Testing is one of my big ones. And I also like to run. So what problem are we really trying to solve? What movie should I see? Wouldn't it be great if I could ask one million people this question? Not just my coworkers, not just my friends, but I could ask a million people. And wouldn't it be great if I could completely automate this process? So to do this, we're going to utilize the power of big data using Apache Spark, Apache Cassandra, Spark machine learning libraries, Jupyter Notebooks, Python, Twitter tweets and API, and a pattern for sentiment analysis. So what this pattern is actually a Python package um, to do sentiment analysis. So we're doing a lot of things here. We're integrating a lot of different technologies all into one to do something really accessible because data analytics doesn't have to be complicated. It can be something as simple as movie reviews. So 
let's go into a very brief introduction to Apache Cassandra. And like I said, we're going to just roll through this as fast as we can, but this is really just to show you about the integration and to get you excited about these various technologies that then you can go on and research more and learn more about and dive into the community. So what exactly is Apache Cassandra? So it was first developed by Facebook, and they released that product that they had into the open source community. And from there, it became a top-level Apache project in 2012. So here is the key, and you see it in bold. Cassandra is a distributed, decentralized database. So keep remembering that word, distributed, even though our demo is local here on my laptop. <laughs> but remember, distributed. It's elastically scalable. You can add and remove nodes with no downtime. And we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. It has high performance. It is very fast. It's highly available and fault tolerant. There is no single point of failure. Again, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. And it solves many of the problems faced with traditional databases for certain workloads. So what is DataStax Enterprise? DataStax has, been one of the, has many of the key contributors to the Apache uh, Cassandra project. Many of the people who contribute to Cassandra actually work for DataStax. So, and then what we did is we took the core of the open source product, and we put it into ours, and it's a commercial product that provides many more cool features, and that's kind of what I'm going to be doing today. It has more QA, testing, my favorite thing, and it has more support. So what does this all mean? Let's talk about the four big topics. Distributed, you already heard me talking about that before. Replication, elastically scalable, and high availability. And here's my note again, we're just doing this very briefly. So distributed, every node in the cluster, in a Cassandra cluster, has the same role. And I put here, really. <laughs> Let me go back here. Really. It really does. Cassandra does not have a master worker architecture. You can connect to any client in the node, uh, or to any node, for all your reads and writes. You're able to do that because they are all the same. There's no uh, gateway uh, node. There's none of that. Each node is the same. But this is not to say that all the nodes contain all the data. Replication. So this is what we're talking about, the data. To be able to survive a node going down, data must be copied to other nodes, right? That just makes sense. If I just have my, co my, my data in just one place, if that node were to go down, the data is lost. So the data has to be copied over across various nodes in a distributed database. So a replication factor is set by the user, and that says how many times do I want my data copied throughout the cluster. So what you can do is you can have n, or one, pardon me, one copy of the data, you can say, oh, maybe this data isn't that important. And if I lose that node, I don't really care. Maybe it's just likes on a Twitter tweet. Maybe it's not that important. Or it's very important data, and I want it copied on every node in my cluster. Now, you have the ability to do that. You probably don't want to do that. It's probably not recommended, because that's probably overkill. So the recomm recommended replication factor is actually three. Because the likelihood that all three nodes at one time are all going to crash and go down, and your hardware's going to fail on all three, is pretty unlikely. So the data is asynchronously replicated. So it's automatic, and it's a peer-to-peer -peer communication. Because we do have no, no master node, so what it does is it pushes the data around peer-to-peer. -peer. Elastically scalable. As more nodes are added, performance increases linearly. So you can scale up and scale down with no downtime. So what this means is that you can, not only can you add nodes to your system, so I used to work on a system uh, a couple of years ago that you actually could not, they had hard limits in their code to say you can only have 64 nodes. That's all. So you can't, e even if you could add them configuration-wise to the cluster, which I worked on the install and configuration period, part of it, even if you were to add it, inside the code, it would never actually utilize them. So this is not the case here at all. You can actually add the nodes. They're added to the cluster. And what it will do is your reads and writes will both increase at scale. And you don't even need a restart, which is pretty amazing. High availability. So how do you get this high availability? The lack of a master node allows for high availability. There is no single point of failure. Replication allows nodes to fail and data to still be available. Because I've copied my data across the cluster, if that node goes down, I have two other copies, if I'm using the recommended three. So 
Cassandra expects nodes to fail. Hardware will fail. There's no getting around that. But Cassandra was designed with that in mind. And so it doesn't panic. It's ready. It's ready to take the challenge. So not only does it have this, but it has multiple uh, data center support right out of the box. So you can have, in your very large cluster, you can have multiple data centers, one in, say, the US, one in Europe, really anywhere. So that way, it helps with a lot of things, but also it puts the data where your customers are. So it reduces latency. So again, you're getting those fast reads and writes. So I want to mention one small trade-off. Because a lot of times you go to these talks, and people from companies, they come, and they tell you all this magic that their product does. And Cassandra is pretty darn close to being magical, but it's not magical. Pretty close, though. So there's something here called the CAP theorem. And you can go off and research this a little bit more. We're just going to touch on it quickly. It's about availability, consistency, and partitioning in your database. And essentially, a database cannot have, when they have um, nodes go down, you cannot have all three. It's impossible. It's just not something you can have. It's an impossible thing. So Cassandra chooses to be eventually consistent as their default. So because you're prior to, you can prioritize uh, consistency over availability, these are all tunable things. But this is actually, um, uh, so it's configurable. All right. So why do I need Cassandra? So let's think about the application that you're actually developing. So do you have big data? Like lots of data. I think, what was it earlier in the keynote? Enormous data. If you have enormous data, you may need Cassandra. Do you need to be able to do reads and writes fast? Do you need to be able to scale up and scale down easily? Because remember, we're able to do that. We don't even need to restart. Do you need high availability? Do you need a cluster that's always up? You need to be able to give your data to your users at any time. Do you need multiple data center support, maybe in different regions, uh, different countries? Do you need multi-cloud or even hybrid cloud support? If your application needs any of these things, you might want to think about using a distributed database like Cassandra. All right, so now a small, very small introduction to Apache Spark. So what is Apache Spark? Apache Spark is a unified analytics engine for large-scale data processing. So and I have this is a quote directly from the Apache Spark website. And I just ripped this right from the website because I think it's actually the perfect definition. So I, I could not write this better. So I'm going to actually say it again and really let it sink in. Apache Spark is a unified analytics engine for large-scale data processing. So this is what's going to do your analytics. This is, what's, this is what we're driving for, right? So it's 10 times faster than Hadoop for analytics. And it does that by using in-memory processing. So it has amazing parallelism because it's distributed across many different nodes. So there's a couple of different things that they have. They have Spark SQL, Spark Streaming, Spark ML, and that's what we're going to utilize today in our demo, GraphX, and Spark R. So we're going to be using the machine learning libraries. So again, why do I need Spark? Again, do you have big data? Do you have enormous data that you need to process and get analytics from? Do you need high availability? Do you need analytics at lightning speed? Are you trying to figure out things in real time? Do you need a simple way to get insights into your data? So if your application needs any of these things, which it probably does, <laughs> then you want to consider using Spark. So what is sentiment analysis? Now I have a lot of data science friends, and they're going to be very sad that we're only going to get one slide on sentiment analysis. Uh, because you can have an entire course on this. Professors can talk about this for days and days and days. But we're just going one slide. OK, so at a very high level, sentiment analysis is actually very simple. It's natural language processing and text analytics to determine if a word or a sentence is positive, negative, or neutral. So at a high level, that's, that's really all it is. So it's pretty easy to understand. We understand this. And it's easy for us to understand, especially when we're speaking to each other. But it's very difficult for machines to learn how to do this, right? And actually, it's getting even harder for us as people to do this. Because think about when you, we text each other. Um, have you ever gotten that text that says, OK, period? And you're like, wait, are they happy? Are they sad? Are they mad? Like, they put a period at the end. What does that mean? It wasn't an explanation point. So 
it's, it's actually getting trickier for us to understand positive and negative and kind of neutral sentiment. So just think how hard it is for a computer. But luckily, we have really great people who are working on these problems. And as you'll see in the demo, making it really simple for us to use. So how does DataSax Enterprise Analytics really help us? So it adds a couple of different things um, that you don't really get by just using open source Apache Cassandra and Apache Spark. So there are connectors that can connect the two. Um, they're available. Um, you can download them now. But with DSE Analytics, um, you just get it right out of the box. I'm just able to pull it, and I just have it running here locally on my laptop. Um, and then even with that, if you have a cluster, you'll have that as well. So it's just very easy, and it, Spark is integrated automatically. So you get high availability on Spark. Um, like I said, Apache Cassandra already comes with high availability, and so of course DSC is going to have that as well. But what it does is we add some, um, we add some support to making Spark um, high available with no single point of failure. Um, and then also support. So when you're working with open source projects like um, Cassandra or Spark, you're really, your support comes from Jira and email and Google. Um, so actually, the user groups for Cassandra and Spark are actually, if you uh, email their user uh, dlist, they're actually incredibly responsive. So it's actually pretty great. I mean, I think I've emailed the Spark user group before. I get like a response in like 20 minutes. So it's pretty good. But with DSC, you get dedicated support. You don't have to email somebody uh, and hope that they answer. Because it's really, I mean, if you know anything about uh, the Apache Foundation, it's all just volunteer. So some, somebody was nice enough to answer me, but they didn't have to. A de uh, with dedicated support, they have to answer you. Uh, deployment, so to connect the two, you have to do like a manual installation. And then we have DSC Op Center, which makes that all automatic. Um, so basically, we have one unified platform to do all this complicated work. All right, so let's get talking about what we're actually going to demo today. So we're going to be analyzing Twitter with DSE Analytics and a Jupyter Notebook. So I have a local DSE Analytics setup here on my laptop. I also have a local Jupyter here on my laptop setup. We're going to pull Twitter data on a movie title. We're going to clean up the tweets, and we're going to walk through that as we go through the demo. Uh, we're going to insert into Cassandra. We're going to create a Spark data frame. Then we're going to use the Spark machine learning libraries. We're going to use tokenize and remove stop word. Then from there, we're going to actually do sentiment analysis with a pattern package, which is the Python package. Um, and it's going to give us the positive or negative. We're going to take an average of these scores. And then we're going to answer the question, should I see this movie? So this is just, OK, so let's get to the demo here. <laughs> let's go back. OK. So can we all see this as well as, as well as we can? OK? So this is a Jupyter Notebook. Now, also, I meant to mention before, um, this is all on my GitHub. So if you uh, watch this repository on GitHub, I'm going to be making changes. And also, you can just pull this down. And if you install DSC and Jupyter on your laptop, you can get this running. So it's pretty, it's pretty simple and easy to use. So basically here, we're going to use DataSax Enterprise, uh, Analytics, Apache Cassandra, Apache Spark, Python, Jupyter Notebooks, Twitter API, Pattern, and Sentiment Analysis. <laughs> so that's a mouthful of all the things that were integrated. So here is basically all the things that you kind of need to get set up to get to this point. So I don't want to walk through all these because it's kind of boring. But it's actually, to get this all set up, I think it took me maybe 20 minutes. So even though it's kind of a long list, it's really not complicated. So then here's just a few environment variables that we have to set to basically say, um, use the PySpark that comes with DSE Analytics. So I'm just going to import those. Then, you know, any standard Python program, I'm going to import all these. Pandas, Cassandra, PySpark, Tweepy. Uh, Tweepy is actually the uh, Python wrapper around the Twitter API, so I can pull from Twitter. Because you can pull live data from Twitter. So then this next one here is just a nice helper function for formatting our data frame. So it's just, it's just for, to make it prettier. So next, OK, now we're getting into some cool stuff. We're going to create our table. We're going to pull the tweets. And we're going to load the table. So here you see, here's the connection to the DSE Analytics cluster. So you can see, again, this is a local host. So it's just here on my laptop. 
So very simple way to connect in. So I create my session here, and now I'm ready to go. So what I'm going to do next is create a key space. Now key space in Cassandra is like if you're familiar with Oracle, it's like a schema. Or if you're familiar with Teradata, it's like a database. It's basically the space that my tables are going to live in. So here we see I'm going to create my key space if it doesn't exist. I'm calling it DSE Analytics Demo uh, with replication. So in this case, I'm just going to use a simple replication strategy, and I'm going to use a replication factor of 1. Because why is that? Because I don't need to replicate my data because I only have one node. I just have my laptop. But now if I was had this on a real cluster, I'm going to have my replication factor be 3 so that it copies my data over and it has that high availability on my data. But basically, if my laptop crashes, I lose my data. All right. And so here we're just going to set the key space so that way we don't have to reference it in the future. So it just says, anything that I do from here, do it inside this key space. All right. Now we're going to set our movie title variable. So you can go ahead and you can change this uh, if you download this and you start playing with it uh, to anything that you want. But I decided on Mission Impossible because it's a brand new movie. And so we're going to look at positive and I called it sad, different tweets. So we're going to create two tables in Cassandra for the movie title, one for negative tweets and one for positive tweets. So we're Twitter returns actually a lot of information with each call. So when you do this poll to Twitter, it gives you a ton of information about each tweet. Actually, you'd probably be kind of shocked at the amount of information that somebody, like a stranger, can pull from Twitter. But it, your Twitter ID, your address, you know, basically your geolocation, <laughs> basically everything you can imagine you could pull from here. But we don't really need now that um, amazing amount of information that you could mine with that. But for this case, because we're just doing something very simple, we're just going to basically, we're just going to parse out the Twitter ID because that's a unique ID. And we're going to set that as our primary key uh, because it's unique. And then we're going to grab the actual tweet, all we really need. Honestly, we don't even really need the Twitter ID, but it's just a good unique value to partition our data by. We really just want the tweet. So we're going to create the table if it doesn't exist. Uh, we're going to use a big int for our Twitter ID, and we're going to use a text uh, variable for our um, tweet. And again, we're going to distribute on our primary key, which is Twitter ID. So we created the tables. Now we're going to set up our search terms to, uh, for gathering tweets from the Twitter API. So this is actually very fascinating, and I just learned this when I was preparing this demo, because actually I was kind of thinking I was going to go a different way with my demo, but then I saw this amazing thing that Twitter does. And it just started doing it recently. It actually is doing its own pass at Cinnamon Analysis on the tweets. It does its own basic pass at it. And so what I can do when I want to pull from the data, you know, pull the data, is I can literally use a sad face or a happy face to pull positive or negative tweets, which is pretty amazing. So I think we're going to see here, um, they're just doing a rough pass at it. So we're going to see actually if they're, if they're um, categorizing them correctly. So it's, it's actually quite interesting. It's very neat to be able to search that way. So then we need to clean up our tweets before we insert it to Cassandra, right? We need to remove things like emojis, flags, special characters, URLs. Remove the retweet. Uh, it comes in as RT if it's a retweet, just because it kind of makes things a little bit noisy. So I just stripped that out as well. Um, now, even though in this case we're stripping all these things out, it would actually be very amazing to do a demo on that if you're analyzing not only the text itself, but also what the emoji is actually saying. Um, that's future work, and that sounds really fun. But for this case, we're going to strip it out. <laughs> so we're going to clean up the tweet. Then here, this is basically when you set up um, from Twitter to pull from their API. You have to have some authentication, right? So they can verify uh, who is who. So just kind of some uh, setting up some, getting some from some environment variables. And now we're able to get our API. So. This next cell is going to pull tweets from Twitter. The max number of tweets returned for free at one time is 100. So you can actually pay, and enterprises do this all the time, you can actually pay to be able to pull more tweets at any one time. But for free, you only get 100. Um, so basically, you can go ahead and loop through and run this a bunch of different times and pull more tweets over time. So like I say here, run this code a couple of times to get more data. So I had just run this. Um, maybe five minutes ago before my talk started. 
Um, and so we'll see how many tweets I got from there. So once the tweets are collected, we're going to loop over the list and clean up each tweet. Then we're going to insert it into the table. So it's a large for loop that surrounds us to make one call for positive tweets and one for negative tweets. So the happy and sad face, remember that's how Twitter is allowing us to pull positive and negative, um, it actually needs to be URL encoded. So that's the URL encoding there. And so um, we could kind of walk through this code, but it's essentially doing basically what I said. And what it's doing as it's, as it's doing that, it's actually printing out some of the tweets. So we can actually read through these and see if there's anything interesting. But now it's just pulling from Twitter based on Mission Impossible and a smiley face. So it's pretty interesting, that the information that we're getting here. <laughs> so now we can do a select star on the table just to verify that it actually got inserted in Cassandra, right? Because we pulled it, we inserted it, but did it actually get there? And so we're seeing here that it did. So we did a select star for movie tweets, and we just said, just give me 10 of them, just limit that. So here we're already seeing a good one. So Tom Cruise is either not, is not human, immortal, or boneless to be able to pull off these amazing stunts. So it sounds like somebody who enjoyed the movie. All right, cool. Now it's time for Apache Spark. So we're going to create a Spark session that connects to Cassandra. So it's going to load each table into a Spark data frame. And from there, we're going to just take account of the number of rows that we have in our, in our data frame. So here we go. So in now we, in our Spark data frame, we have 125 po in our positive table, 127 in our negative table. So that's actually good because it's about equal. So that's nice. OK, so then, then the very first thing we're going to do with Spark is we're going to tokenize to break up the sentence into individual words, right? Because we want to just break it up instead of a sentence because our um, pattern sentiment analysis, it can't really deal with the sentence. So we really have to just chop it up into individual words. So here, so once we do that for the, on the positive and the negative side, we have our, and this is just the data frame and I printed it out. So we have the original tweet and then we have the, where it's cut up into words. And then I had the word here tokens. It really should just be number of words. So we see kind of how many words were in each tweet. So we have that for the positive and for the negative. So now we're gonna do, again using Spark, we're gonna remove all the stop words. And so stop words, if you're not familiar, are just things like of, they, a, you know, just kind of all those words, the grammar words that we put in our sentence to have our sentence make sense. Uh, but really don't add any value to whether the, the sentiment is positive or negative. So what Spark is gonna do is it's gonna go through and do that. And I just wanna highlight something here, which when you're looking at this demo, kind of may get lost. But here we are doing this in three lines of code, three lines of Python code, we are removing all the stop words. Now, here on my laptop with 100 tweets, that's not really, I mean, it's pretty cool. It's only three lines of code. That's pretty great, because uh, imagine trying to do that by hand. Um, but it's not really that impressive. But imagine at scale. Imagine you're streaming in Twitter data, and you're able to do that kind of a, uh, get that done with three lines of code. That's pretty incredible. Oops, let's go back here. OK, so we pulled. Then we show our, okay, we tokenized, we stopped words. All right, now it's time for the true fun. So now we're going to use the sentiment analysis um, using a Python package called Pattern. So we're going to create um, a Panda data frame from our Spark data frame. So now I just want a little caveat here. This works as is because I'm working with a small data set. For a larger data set, if you're working with this at scale, um, to convert to a pandas data frame, you need to make sure that the pandas fits in memory. So whatever, be it your laptop, be it the server, wherever it is, whatever you're pulling in to, to do that convert to pandas, it has to fit in memory. So we're going to loop over each row and get the sentiment score. Anything plus is positive, anything minus is negative, or zero is just neutral. So the po there's a positive function that actually is going to return basically just a Boolean, yes or no, so not just a score. And there's also an assessment function, which is actually very cool, which is going to show what words they use to judge whether this is positive or negative. Because it kind of picks out words that it thinks are the most important in your sentence and says, this is the one I really based my, my judgment on. So here we go, and we're going to loop through this for negative tweets. And so I've just kind of printed them out here. So here it says, here's the very first one. I want to see Mission Impossible, but I know it's dumb. 
but spies. So actually, that's kind of interesting because it does kind of have a negative sentiment, but the person really wants to see the movie. They actually like the movie. They just feel dumb for seeing it for some reason. So it doesn't really get sarcasm, <laughs> right? So it's going to give this a negative score. It's going to say, no, yeah, you said dumb. <laughs> All right, so then we can scroll down here. So let's just kind of list out all the tweets. Sorry, it's a little bit ugly, the output, but here's some much nicer output. So here we see the original tweet that we just saw above, but it kind of cuts it off, so that's why I want to show it above. I want to see Mission Impossible, but I know it's dumb. So here's our sentiment score, which is negative 0.9. And look, so it says, is it positive? No, it's not, it's negative. It's using this word impossible. Ah, it is, and look at that negative score, negative 0 0.6. Hmm, maybe we should have done something up above on this movie title. Mission Impossible, impossible. Ugh, we're kind of, we're kind of messing with our results here. We probably should have removed the movie title from our sentiment analysis, right? Because that, the movie title itself isn't really adding to the sentiment. Uh, but this is very interesting, and we're going to see below how it affected things. I think you see you. I think you all see what's going to happen here. <laughs> so then here we are on our positive side, doing the same thing. Let's scroll up here a bit. Um, let's see if we can see a good one. Just watch Mission Impossible: Fallout. Good movie with a smiley face. Okay, and let's see if we can find that one below. Just number five, just watch Mission Impossible Fallout. Okay, so we got a sentiment score of 0 0.6, so that's, that's pretty positive. That's very close to one, that's very good. We get a positive here on our, our, it's true. And then what's it using to judge? Oh good, it's using the word good. It's giving that a very high positive score. Okay, and it's also using, which is amazing, it's using the smiley face. It's giving that also a very positive score of 0 0.5. Okay, so cool. So it's using those good words, and it's kind of ignoring that word impossible in this case. All right, so we've done all this. Should I see this movie? So here I talked about before, we took an average of all the positive scores and all the negative scores, and we divided by the number of tweets that I had. And basically what we're going to say here is if my positive score is greater than my negative score, people like this movie because it has a better, more people are strongly positive about it than sad. We're going to say, people really like this movie. If the scores are the same, I'm going to say people are split. Take a chance. Go to the movies. It's fun. And if the negative or the positive rating is less than the negative rating, we're going to say people do not like this movie. Okay. So here we go. So here's our positive rating average score, which is 0 0.3. Okay. That's all right. That's, you know, it's not as strongly positive as we were kind of seeing in the in the, tw in the tweets, but that's all right. Plus, we know Rotten Tomatoes has re written, uh, so that Mission Impossible is very high. You know, go see it. It's certified fresh. So that's kind of a little bit surprising that it's that low. And then here's our negative rating average score, negative 0.4. That's pretty negative. So in our analysis, the way we've written this, we're saying people don't like this movie. Don't go see it. So is this answer what you were expecting? Either way, go back and take a look at it. So that's about data science, right? It's iterating through. It's not just, oh, that's the answer. Let's move on, right? It's thinking about what you got and going back over it. And so like we learned today, maybe we should have removed that word impossible. All righty. So that was the demo. All righty. So just some more information and links. So you can get this demo, like I mentioned before. It's on my GitHub under uh, Big Data Day LA. Uh, I wasn't up to date on the new name change yet. And there's more analytics to come. Because here we were using the pattern sentiment analysis for sentiment analysis. But actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this information, I'm going to feed it back, and then I'm going to start training my own model using Spark. So that's kind of the future state here. Um, learn more about Cassandra at DataStax Academy. Learn more about Spark. And you can learn more about DataStax. Follow me on Twitter. I'm Amanda DataStax. And check us out on Twitch. My boss actually here, Jeff, he's going to be doing a Twitch that shows this whole uh, demo dockerized. Um, and so he's going to be doing that very soon. So subscribe to our, our Twitch channel. Awesome. So thank you so much. And come visit our booth. And also, we are hiring. So please stop by and say hello.
Does it do? Does that work? Um. Oh, uh huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm sure there's ways that you can incorporate that for sure. On sentiment analysis, I mean, I'm sure you can still get the sentiment on any any information that you're feeding it. It may not it may not be as 